So thanks for coming to this session. My name is Daniel Balgrave, and I'm going to talk about machine learning for personalized health. So um, I'm not a software engineer, I'm a machine learning researcher, and um, this is a subject that I'm really passionate about. So I do work with, with software developers and engineers as well on these sorts of problems. So I'm gonna give a high level overview on machine learning for healthcare and um, how we can run machine learning models for personalized health. So just a bit about the research that I actually do. So most of my research is based on using probabilistic graphical models for understanding disease heterogeneity. And the idea is that a lot of diseases um, are probably misclassified, and the evidence we have for that is that the same treatment for a given disease doesn't work for everybody in the same way. So with latent variable modeling, a lot of the work I do is trying to understand um, this heterogeneity based on different symptom profiles over time, and how you can capture uncertainty around disease diagnosis as well. Uh, a lot of the data I have is longitudinal data, so I do a lot of analysis around longitudinal data analysis. A problem that's inherent in, um, in data, especially in healthcare data, is missing data. Uh, so a lot of the work I do is actually formulating probabilistic models around missingness. Um, what sort of inference can we draw about missing data? What are the assumptions? How we could we incorporate those assumptions into the models we make? Also look a lot at causality. This is very important in, in health. And a lot of the work I do has two characteristics. One is that it's multidisciplinary. So I work with social scientists, with engineers, and with clinicians to try to understand healthcare systems and understand health as well. And the work is very patient-centric. And I think this is really important, that the patient is at the center of, of this, um, this sort of research, and the patient is what motivates this research as well. Um, because sometimes we can think about, think about clinician empowerment, but here what we're thinking about is patient empowerment and how to help people take their health into their own hands. So why personalized healthcare? Well, I spent quite a bit of time working in the pharmaceutical industry. And um, in the pharmaceutical industry, this is typically how you set up an experiment to test a drug. So you have a group of patients with some disease, and you split them up into two populations. One population, you give an intervention or some drug that you want to trial. And the other population, you give a control, which is usually what's already on the market. So you want to see whether the new intervention works better than the control. And hopefully your intervention works better, so you can put that drug in the market, and you run your favorite test statistic to compare those two groups and compare the number of patients cured in the new intervention group compared to the number of patients cured in the control group. So hopefully you have a success with, with the drug. But actually what we see in real life once a drug goes out into the market is that um, even though you have the same patient's group, with the same disease on the same prescription, they respond differently to treatment. And this is the whole motivation for looking at machine learning methods for personalized healthcare. So some patients may benefit from the drug and there are no side effects. With other patients, there are toxic side effects even though there are benefits. And sometimes the benefits don't, um, don't compensate for the toxicity of the drug. Some patients don't respond to the drug, no side effects, and some patients not only do they not respond to the drug, but they have really bad side effects. I think this is the sort of thing you see a lot in cancer treatments as well, that not everybody responds in the same way. And what we're trying to do is to understand why. So the focus of, of this talk and a lot of the work I do is on endotype discovery. And this is the grand challenge, to try to understand subgroups of complex diseases that even though we have a single diagnosis for disease, maybe there are multiple syndromes within that common diagnosis. And this can help us to understand what's the underlying mechanism that drives those, um, those differences in response to drugs, even though we see the same symptoms on the, on the surface. Is there some way we could identify different subgroups and this is the foundation for, for stratified medicine. We're trying to seek better, more targeted interventions to, and doing that by trying to understand the heterogeneity in disease symptoms as well. So endotype comes from the Greek endo, which means containing, and type, which are things with common characteristics. And um, disease heterogeneity is something that we see a lot 
uh, when you see not only heterogeneity in how symptoms are manifested over time, but that heterogeneity in drug response, which is really what we're trying to get at. Um, so with endotype discovery, what we're trying to do is, um, is identify a subtype of a condition, and the main characteristic of an endotype is that there's some pathophysiological mechanism that underlines what you see on the surface. So the general framework for identifying disease endotypes are um, using probabilistic graphical models. So this is like the general framework that, that I use to motivate throughout this talk. So the squares at the bottom are phenotypes or things that you observe. So these could be different, um, different symptoms that a patient comes into the doctor with. And you have some sort of latent variable, which isn't directly measured. You can't directly measure it, but you can infer the presence of that latent variable or your endotype um, based on the observations you see over time, which are your phenotypes. So just to make the distinction that not all subtypes are endotypes. So an endotype means that a particular subtype of disease has a different underlying mechanism. Um, and this is something that's very frequent, mostly in psychiatry data and in, yeah, in psychometrics. So examples of, I think, where it's more obvious to find these endotypes are in things like mental health conditions or in IQ tests. So for example, with depression, you can't directly measure depression. You have to ask a series of questions and you can infer some sort of latent variable that um, can help you to understand whether someone has mild, moderate, or severe depression and therefore get the right treatment. Or for example, with IQ testing as well, it's the same. You can't directly measure IQ, but you can infer um, based on a series of questions. So this is the same sort of philosophy that we're trying to use with, with symptoms as well. So for probabilistic programming, which is a general framework for discovering these endotypes as well, we have this probabilistic program to identify what is the latent structure based on the series of symptoms we have. So in a probabilistic program, you have some probabilistic model, which expresses the general knowledge about a, a situation. So very often, you go to your favorite clinician who you're working with or collaborating with, and um, I have my favorites, and uh, you, you sort of try to, try to quantify uh, how they see the world, what is the domain knowledge, how they think different symptoms are correlated, what is correlated and what is causal, and try to put some sort of parameters around that in a probabilistic model. So a probabilistic model expresses our general knowledge about a particular situation. And we have evidence, which is the data, and contain, this contains specific information about this situation. And we have some queries that we want to ask of this, of this probabilistic model as well. And this expresses things that will help us to make decisions um, on clinical outcomes. And then we have an inference algorithm, which we use to answer the different queries, and we get an answer to the queries, which are framed as probabilities of different outcomes. And there are different ecosystems for running these probabilistic programming models. So the one that I mostly use is Info.net, which is a Microsoft um, inference engine on C Sharp. So you have some probabilistic program that you put into an Info.net compiler and um, you get your probability distributions. And there are other ecosystems as well. Uh, so Pyro is a new one that's come out. Stan is quite a standard one as well, and Edward. And um, there are these different, these different ecosystems for doing probabilistic modeling, but the particular one I've used is Info.net. So now I'm going to motivate this in, um, in asthma and allergic diseases, which has actually been where the bulk of my research has been over the past eight years. So with asthma, um, the hypothesis is that asthma is actually an umbrella term uh, that actually um, is several different diseases because what happens is when someone, especially with children, so with children it's very hard to make a diagnosis of asthma uh, because the lung isn't developed until they're seven years old. 
So if a child comes into a clinic, they'd have these sorts of symptoms. They have allergy, poor lung function, they're wheezing, they have symptoms that look like asthma. They go in, out, in and out of hospital for, inhale, for steroids. And a doctor would see them and say, this is asthma. But actually what we see is that there, there are different responses to medication and also different manifestations of symptoms over time. So some children may grow out of asthma, some respond to treatment, some don't respond to treatment, and some um, develop asthma later on in life. So what we're trying to do is think, well, are these actually different endotypes or different diseases with different causes? So, I'll unmotivate this with two problems. The first problem is trying to understand what is the asthma endotype or subtype in a population-based birth cohorts of 2,000 children. So this is data from the Manchester Asthma and Allergy Study in the UK. And we had the primary care records for children in the first eight years of life. And also we asked their parents questions every year to see whether or not they had symptoms of wheeze or asthma. And what we're trying to do is identify whether there's some distinct underlying genetic or physiological marker for these different subtypes of asthma. So this is the modeling strategy. We have the observed variables, which are your GP records. So GP is like um, general practitioner. So it's the electronic healthcare record for a particular trials. Um, and we assume that that's the ground truth. So we give it a weighting of one. And then we have observations from parents of the children in each year of life. So each, each parent, every year, they are asked a question on whether or not they've seen a child's wheezing in the past 12 months, and also about asthma medication as well. So we assume that there's some latent variable, which is your true current wheeze, um, which we don't really know whether that's asthma or not. We just, we, and also it's very hard to measure wheeze. And we assume that there's some subtype of wheeze, K, but we don't know the number of of um, we subtypes, and we don't know how many children are in each of those subtypes as well. And we model this through a longitudinal logistic regression model, and we assume that um, the probability of a particular child wheezing at a given time point is conditioned on what is the probability of being a member of one of these subtypes or endotypes. And what we found when we did that is that there are actually five distinct subtypes of, of asthma. So asthma is actually a heterogeneous phenomena. And if we look at the profile of, children's, of children over time, we see that if we assign children to their highest posterior probability class, we get these five subtypes. And just at a high level, um, what we notice is that there are two groups of persistent Weezers, or you could call them what you classify as asthmatics. A lot of children grow out of asthma. A lot of children get asthma later on in life. But the orange and the red line, the sort of ones with the two highest probabilities, um, are what we call persistent, persistent weezers. And the red line, which are 13% of the population, we classified as persistent controlled weezers because they're the ones who respond to treatment. And the orange line, which is 3% of the population, are the ones that are really interesting because they're the ones who don't respond to treatment. So we call them persistent troublesome wheeze. And on this next line, you see, we could see that more clearly. So on the left-hand side, the top line, which is the orange line, we see that those are the children who are receiving inhaled corticosteroids. So they're receiving asthma treatments. And the next plot, we see their hospital admissions and whether they're going to hospitals to receive, inhales, to receive oral steroids, which is a severe intervention. So even though these children are on treatments, they're still being hospitalized. So their asthma is not being controlled, whereas the red line is being controlled. So essentially, we saw a motivation where we can actually discover these sorts of endotypes in, in asthma. And we noticed that there are four different subtypes of asthma and possibly these subtypes represent different endotypes. So we have a group of transient early wheezers, late onset wheezers, persistent troublesome wheezers, and persistent controlled wheezers. And we've done some further work, and we realize that these also have distinct genetic and environmental associations as well, and different responses to treatment. And it was really exciting when I was working in, in um, 
Gloucester Smith Klein at the time, uh, that there was a drug be being put onto market at that time that got, um, that got FDA approval. And this was for a particular subtype of asthmatics. Um, I can't remember what the drug was called, but basically the development of the drug was based on identifying what are these different biomarkers that can help us to distinguish um, different subtypes of asthma. And it was interesting to see that movement towards developing more personalized treatment and management strategies of, of asthma in particular and of disease in general. So this is something that can motivate looking at other disease areas as well. The second example I'm going to motivate based on uh, trying to understand subtypes of disease is something called the allergic march. Um, I don't know if this is something that's very pre prevalent in the US, but actually it is prevalent in the US as well, probably in certain geographical areas more so than others. And this is a hypothesis around why people develop allergy or hay fever. Uh, or rhinitis, so I use those terms interchangeably. So basically, in medical textbooks, you see something like that plot with the three sort of squiggly curves. Um, so this explains why people get hay fever. So the hypothesis is that in early life you have eczema, then it causes you to develop asthma later on in life, and then it causes you to develop rhinitis or hay fever later on in life. And this is how people get allergy. So who cares? Well, the reason this is important is because this is how um, drugs are developed. This is a motivation for development of drugs for hay fever. So the idea is that if you stop eczema in early life, you can stop people getting hay fever later on in life. And we wanted to see whether this actually works in real life. Um, so again, using these probabilistic graphical models, we wanted to capture disease heterogeneity and encapsulate these different patterns of symptoms over time. And the idea was to understand the probabilistic dependencies to identify some sort of meaning, meaningful latent structure and understand what are the dependencies between those symptoms over time. So we assumed some priors, some Dirichlet priors with equal probability to each class. And again, we don't know the number of latent classes or the size and we calculated each child's posterior probability of belonging to a particular latent class. So this was done on data from two geographical locations in the UK. So those two were the arrows, Manchester and Bristol, and it was a total of 12,000 children over 11 years. And in the first model, we ran a hidden Markov model where we assumed that eczema, asthma, and hay fever, or rhinitis, are independent conditions. So the probability of observing eczema at a given time point is conditioned on what happens at the previous time point. And the same with wheeze and, and rhinitis, and this is governed by some overarching latent class. In the second model, we actually um, explicitly inferred uh, allergic march, where we assumed that um, the probability of rhinitis at a given time point is conditioned on the probability of asthma at the previous time point and conditions on the probability of eczema at the previous time point. So similar to an allergic march. And the third, we just assumed that there's some longitudinal latent disease profile over time and symptoms could be independent. So um, you have some latent state or of disease at each time point and the eczema, wheeze, and rhinitis aren't necessarily linked over time like a hidden Markov model. So then we compared the models using model evidence. And um, when you test different priors and also different numbers of classes, we found consistently that the third model, so that's the independent conditions over across time, that's the best model um, if you use eight latent classes. And if we look at that, we saw that actually what we see on a cross-sectional level, so if you look at all of the children in the world today, you would see a profile similar to an allergic march. But actually, um, only 3% of children follow something similar to an, an allergic march um, on an individual level. And most people have eczema by itself, wheeze by itself, and rhinitis by itself. So, the take-home message was that um, actually there's heterogeneity in these different profiles of symptoms over time, 
and it's not a single causal condition. So there's heterogeneity on an individual level for these different symptoms, and they're different co-occurrences. So enotype discovery can lead to better understanding of underlying biological mechanisms for different subtypes of disease, and probabilistographical modeling is an intuitive framework for incorporating prior knowledge for endotype discovery. And I've also touched on some of the different challenges, um, which I've not gone into too deeply for this talk, around um, looking at cohort data and trying to understand these profiles on a population level. So there are challenges around missing data, um, actually trying to infer causality, uh, where, you, where you're not too sure what the time sequence of events is, and also estimating treatment effects. But I think one of the big take-home messages from, from this work is the importance of clinical context that it's really important to think deeply about the clinical context to find solutions which are specific to the problem. And this also motivates doing interdisciplinary research as well, um, that the machine learning researchers need to understand the problem and also the engineers working on the project need to understand the problem as well. Um, and also we do a lot of work with social scientists to try to understand the context very deeply. And this is what good science is about. It's about merging different schools of thought to develop a bigger picture as well. So the approach is very much problem-led. It's not just give me the data set, but really trying to incorporate domain knowledge and take a data-driven approach to machine learning for personalized health. And this is what team science is about. Um, I think this is something we can't drive home enough, uh, that discoveries about healthcare are not necessarily hypothesize a priori, but have to be, have been made by experts explaining structure learned from data by algorithms, tunes by those experts. And there's a need for a heuristic blends between different, different um, disciplines. So these are a lot of the collaborators that I've worked with on these projects. And also I'm currently working uh, at Microsoft Research in Cambridge in the healthcare team. And um, in Microsoft, there's lots of great work going on in the healthcare team. So two of the flagship projects are a project called MNI, which is looking at medical imaging to empower clinicians, and um, also project EMMA, which is using wearables for tremors associated with Parkinson's disease. And I think these are two really good examples of really trying to understand the domain to find solutions to these problems using machine learning approaches, but then thinking, how can we translate these machine learning approaches into technology that actually helps people? So I'm gonna show a video at the end about Project Emma. And um, I think this is really a good example of how uh, we can use these sorts of discoveries to empower people and to change lives. Okay, all right, I'm going to try and replicate this here. We're off to a great start. I tend to kind of just avoid doing sketching and writing now because it's just, it's not really worth it if you get something like that. Anything you could do that would just make my hand do what I want it to do and yeah. be able to sign yeah. my name would be an incredible thing. How do we even just begin to help her overcome this particular symptom of her tremors and helping her be able to regain her writing ability, her drawing ability? So what I'm doing is I'm making a, a very rough prototype. And what this board does is I can connect into it through these wires, these um, tiny coin cell motors. So these motors will vibrate I personally think that what this is doing is it's short-circuiting whatever feedback loop there is between the brain and the hand that's causing the, the tremors. So the idea is if you are distracted by the vibration, are you able to write better? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> it's affecting something. I don't quite know what's happening. I'm on to something, right? I'm on, I'm on to something. Jesus 
It makes me forget that I have a tremor. <laughs> I've drawn one of them for a long time. <laughs> I've actually just written my name for like the first time in ages. I can't believe it. Mum, it's called the Emma. Oh, brilliant. It's, it's got my name on it. <laughs> <laughs> This is a really nice project showing how, um, how research can be used to improve human life and to really empower people by understanding the problems deeply that people face. So that's it from me. Thank you very much for listening. And I'm happy